introduction to money and banking. So before I even proceed, what do you know about money? And sir, please, it's something we use in exchange for goods and services. Thank you. Any other? It's a lot tender as I just put that in. Um, I think I like that definition. Can I come back again? I only remember the legal thing that it is. Yeah, I wanted you to repeat your sentence. I'm finding that the definition of yeah, is it Johnson or Yvonne or Roland? It's Johnson. Johnson, oh, okay. Yes. So, Johnson, let's go. Yes, sir. money is a formal legal tender uh, which is used as a medium of exchange. Yeah. Okay. For goods and services. All right. Thank you. Maureen, I, I saw your hand. It's gone. He has said it. Yeah, I said everything there. Yes. So you don't mind repeating what he said, I guess. Money is a legal tender used in the exchange. I've forgotten what he said, but that's what. But so now that that is, that is why I said, can you say what he said? Because he said he said what he wanted to say. So it's not. Okay. It's not really the same. Oh, okay, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yes. Okay, money is a generally accepted means of exchange and measure for value. Thank you. Blessing. Um, sir, please, it's a legal tender used in the payment of goods and services. Oh, okay. Is this the blessing I know? Yes, sir. All right. All right, thank you. So you guys really have a perfect understanding of what money is. Okay, whatever you guys said, it's a full definition of money. Okay, so by the end of this lecture, okay, by the end of this lecture, uh, we are going to, so basically we are going to introduce you guys to money and how the financial system works Okay, so we are going to explain the meaning and functions of money, give an overview of the financial system, and introduce the principles of fractional reserve banking. So by the end of this lecture, you guys would understand why we say commercial banks don't really print money, but they create money. So we are going to learn how commercial banks create money at the end of the lecture. Okay, so this is our objective. The objective is you will define money, explain its main importance or functions. We will explain the structure of financial system and the role of financial institution and financial markets, explain the concept of money demand and the main determinants of money demand. We will explain the main measures of aggregate money supply. Then the last one, of course, this one won't happen in this lecture, but the next lecture, which will be monetary policy. We are going to demonstrate equilibrium in the money market where interest rates are determined. Okay, so let's set the ball rolling. Um, so this is your reading list, okay? Abel, Benanke, and Crosho, chapter seven of it. You can see whatever we are coming to do today there. Monkey and Taylor, I remember I sent this to Johnson. I don't know if he has sent it to you guys. The chapter 10 of it. Then we, yes, so- We don't have it. You don't have it, okay? So I'll fix it later, okay? But like, you can also download it, okay? You can just type the name so of the- So it has been sent to the group. Yes, I did, I already did. Thank you very much, Johnson. God bless you. So you can equally download this. Just type Monkey and Taylor, then add the word PDF to it. 
okay, if you really want the book, that's how we really do it. Or we have a website that I can equally share. The moment you type the book there, they will give it to you, okay. Then we will use the uh, monthly quarterly bulletin of the Bank of Ghana, okay. So, you know, this is, this slides were prepared way back 2015. So that's why we are using the second quarter of 2015, okay. So probably you would want to use the most recent bulletin, which probably could be 20, we could use the 2020. So when you see this, uh, like it's called the second, when you go to the Bank of Ghana website, you can find this there, okay. All right, so or better start download it and share it with you guys. But I would be happy if you guys learn how to download it. That won't hit at all. Okay, so we are just taking it from money, money, money. So you guys have already defined money, and I would want you to tell you, uh, like I would want to tell you how money has evolved over time. Okay, so there was a case where some years back, okay, we, we didn't have the economy. So what we were trying to do all the time is to probably exchange goods for goods. Okay, so let's say if you have a pen and I have a pen, we can exchange it. Or probably you have a pen, I have a book. Then we can also exchange it. Okay. That kind of exchange was once known as butter system. Okay, so when we say butter system, we are basically saying that it's a direct exchange of what? Goods and services. Okay, so maybe, you know, let, let's use more real stuff. You have rice. Okay, I also want maybe grass. a bed. Okay, I need a bed. You can exchange your rice with a bed with me. Okay, or better still, you could also have another goods that you can also exchange with me. Basically, that's all about the butter system, okay? But the butter system had a very common problem, okay? And the problem was the something we call double quant. That was the problem of what? The butter system. So we had to introduce money into the system. And when we say double coincidence of ones, basically what we are trying to say is before person A can trade with person B, they must want what person B has and must have what person B is looking for. Okay. So it could be that you have rice, you want to exchange it with something. Okay. What if I don't have that thing? Okay. So sometimes some people would have cows, but they need rice. But I don't need cow. Maybe I have mine. So I, it means I can't exchange it with you. So um, the economy. So some people just sat and thought of, why don't we introduce a very simple commodity that could place value on everything? Okay, so that brought about the introduction of what? Money. Okay, because the butter system had some inefficiencies, we had to introduce what? Money into the equation. So now, this is basically what you guys explained to me. When we say money, money is anything that says as what? Commonly acceptable medium exchange okay so this is the main function of money now because of the introduction of money we don't have that issue of let's say you have 2000 Ghana cities you can buy whatever you want you don't really need someone who also needs 2000 Ghana cities for you to exchange with a person okay so it has been very simple for life Okay, but one thing you should also put in mind is throughout history, okay, a number of different commodity have been used as money. Now, when we say commodity, basically, they are the goods that we exchange for what? Another good. 
Okay, that's why we call that commodity monies. Okay, so in years ago, some people were using cigarette as commodity money. Some were using Kyrie, some were using ivory, some were using gold, oil, beer, copper, as what money. So if let's say I need something, I can come and I'll be like, I have beer. Do you want to give me this? Then I give the thing back to you. So all those stuff were called commodity monies. Okay, now, as a form of evolution, money has really evolved. So now we don't really need cigarettes to exchange for something, or we don't need ivory to search for something. Now we have a very simple one called the paper money. And the paper money is what you and I have currently on us. Okay, if you don't have some, don't worry, I'll send you some. Don't worry. Okay, so when we say already I've explained commodity money and I'm explaining paper money. Okay, so the of them had some intrinsic value. Really, they, they don't really go up as a result of the demand for them, but as a result of the value they, they have inwardly causes them to just increase over time. Um, another issue was that the, there were high demands for reason other than their money function. And that's basically what I was saying with the intrinsic value. Okay, so let's say there is an occasion, people need more beer. Okay, so this could cause high demand of beer. At that point in time so everyone would want to give out his or her beer for something okay so usually have on each other okay so as i told you earlier let's say we have um an occasion and everyone needs beer okay you should know that beer is going to be be of high demand hence reducing the supply of it Okay, so there will be a shortage in the market. Okay, and these are some of the issues that were actually hitting people at that particular time. So the thought of um, reviving the economy by what, bringing something for the people money. Okay, which is basically not wanted for its own sake. Okay, so you can have an occasion today and if you don't have money, it means that location can be successful because you would need money to basically buy everything in that particular occasion. Okay, so um, we introduced money so that we could keep the issue of all those commodity money issues that we had. Okay, the next one is uh, the paper currency or the currency you and I currently we are using. It's also called fiat. Okay, so when we say fiat money, basically all that we are trying to say is a legal tender by government. So if you have, let's say, one CD note on you, let's open it. You will see that they've, they've written some point, I think where the signature is, they've written, this is declared by legal tender. You could see that on most of our monies. Okay, so anytime you hear fiat money, it's the same as the paper or the coin we are using. Okay, let me see my chat room i think all right hey nyan the the number there is it my number or your number my momo number hey nyan because i said i'll be momo very soon afaho e be yeme la la Okay, so now we, we must also understand. I believe where I've got into and please that's not a rhetorical question. Yes, <laughs> yes. All right. Actually, I need your feedback to know whether I'm doing a good job or a bad one. Okay. Okay, so, okay, all right, thank you. So we are going to talk about the functions of money. 
Okay, money actually have three main functions. I know you can see two on the screen. What is the last one? Unit of account. Yeah. Johnson, there is unit of account on the screen. Yeah, a store of value. Okay, so the store of what? Value. These are the three main functions of money. Okay, so the first one is a medium of exchange. Okay, and this is the main function of money. So that is why when we were defining money, you saw money says as what? A medium of exchange. Okay, so basically, if you have money on you, you pay something, you take something. So there is an exchange. Okay, now, putting that aside, we also said that with the commodity money, sometimes you need um, or the butter system. When we had the butter system, you need something to exchange for something. And sometimes someone can bring a whole cow just to come for a sheep. Okay, so that wasn't really fair. Okay, so money serving as a unit of account allows us to what, place value on each of these stuff. Okay, it tells us to place value on each of these commodities so that we can what, price them. Okay, so basically now you can't just come and exchange your cow with just a bag of rice. Okay, now we, we, we know the price of cow which can be like 300 times of a bag of rice. Okay, so these are some basic um, functions of money. So money helps us to place value on what? Um, the commodities we have. The next one is a store of value. Okay, so basically now we can now produce or we can sell our farm produce. Okay, then we would convert all those produce them. Okay, for the future. So now money helps us to be able to, you know, I know till now some people still save money in the ground. Others still save money in their various homes, money box, susu box, and all, okay? Because money is having that particular function that serves as what? A unit of, uh, or a store of value. Okay, so we can also our product, get the money, and need that place them in the banks or some other places. Now, we are going to also learn something about aggregates or monetary aggregates. Okay, so when I say monetary aggregate, I wanted to ask what is it, but I don't remember discussing anything like aggregates with you. Okay, so when we say monetary aggregate, all that we are trying to say is we want to understand how the aggregate supply of money is measured. Okay, so basically in layman's term, we want to understand how we measure money. Okay, so monetary aggregates can be classified into two main groups. Okay, so we have something called the broad money, which is also known as M1, and we have the next one called what? The narrow money. Oh, okay, so I said broad money first. Okay, so narrow is M1, then the broad is called M2. Okay, so under M1, you would want to understand this perfectly because the tutorial set will give you some series of um, statements. Then they will tell you to categorize them under M1, M2, and in Ghana, we have another one called M2 plus. You would understand why we call it M2 plus very soon. Okay, so you would want to understand this clearly. Now, if I say M1 money, we are saying that M1 money consists of paper currency and coins with the public. Okay, you would want to also underline that statement with the public. Okay, so let's say if commercial bank prints money and they leave that money in their vaults, okay, or the money printed by a commercial uh, central bank and it's not being distributed to the general, not like distributed, basically, it has not been introduced to the general public. That money is in their vault cannot be classified as M1. Paper and coins, which one is demand deposit? 
account. Okay, so that money that is in your checking account is also classified as what? M1. Okay, now when we talk about M2, which is broad money, the broad money consists of M1. Okay, so it's starting from the top. So it means the broad money consists of our paper and the coins with the public plus the demand deposit account, plus savings account, plus time deposit account. And when you say, well, savings account is very common, so I wouldn't want to talk about it. But when we talk about time deposit account, it is also known as fixed deposit account, okay? We are calling it time deposit account because one, if you deposit that amount of money in the bank, okay, we have time limit on it. So that time is due. You can't go in for your money. Okay, so it's like, let me use unqualified word like it's a contract. So you can't breach that contract that, oh, I saved, um, I did, or I, I invested in treasure, uh, fixed deposits for three months, but there is some serious issue in my home or um, that I'm encountering. So I'm coming for my, my money within two months. Okay, it doesn't work that way. So if it is three months, until that three months is due, you can't go in for your money. That's why we call it time deposit account. Okay, now, SP. Say, so, so please, what about the savings account? My internet was messing up, so I didn't hear that one. Okay, actually, I never, I never said anything about the savings account because I said it's common. You know, with the savings account, you can anytime go in for your money. But with a fixed deposit account, you can't go in for your money until the time is due. Are we okay? Sir. Yes, SP. Um, please, sir, please, treasure bills and bonds, are they part of the time deposit? The time deposit. Ninety-one days, we have 182 days, we have 270 days, which it, when it becomes 270 days, we call it commercial paper. Then we have 364 days for the treasury bill. Okay, so as you can see, it's timing. Okay, so yes, when it is bonds, okay, when it is bonds, we have so many types of bonds. So I wouldn't want to commit myself today as far as what a time deposit. But if only that thing or that investment needs time and then we can classify it as what time deposit whether you get it yes sir. and the question would categorically state that maybe uh, you have three three weeks um something something so far as we are bringing time in it you should bring it under m2 are we cool okay so what about shares or oh, that one will so not that is why i said i wouldn't want to really commit myself because you know when we say shares shares they are just papers all, 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 the, all these four maybe two this and this is the maturity date okay so first when they give you the maturity date then that becomes onto that maturity date it means transport money But the sun you can for and go for yes. your even the thing. I don't want to meet myself, but you are put this in Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any so please I wanted to ask why demand deposit account is not like part of the M2. Like seeing savings account is part of M2. Account. Yes. Okay, so when we say demand deposit account, basically, eh, it's like uh, uh, your account with um, the bank, okay, your checking account, the bank, and it's basically like, at the, okay, so let me make it clear here. So the M1, say, the M1s are the most liquid currencies we can ever have. Okay, we can never have. Then the M2, which is the broad one, they are not liquid. Okay, sometimes depending on where you are saving the money, if it is in your room, then we assume that 
it's liquid because when we say it's liquid, you can quickly access it and use it for something. Okay, that's why we are saying it's liquid. So when it is not liquid, it takes time. Okay, so um, when we say the demand deposit um, account, it, it's really, I don't know how to put it. It's something you can easily get in touch with. Okay, you can just, I want a perfect example to explain this. Okay, so you send me for nine, maybe I'll get um, a perfect example, but remind me, okay, before I, I forget, okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. You're welcome. Sir. Sir. Yes. Uh, Please, uh, I how? hope that not um, M1 is part of uh, the broad money. So as a result of that, demand deposit to be part of broad money. Oh. Basically, so when we get broad money, paper currency plus the coin. Please, do you get it? Please, I didn't hear you. Okay, so what I was saying that is that when we get to broad money broad money consists of the m1 so basically it will be like paper currency and coins with a public demand deposit savings account and time deposits please you get it yes sir yes sir All thank right. you very much You're sir, please you Yantiki. speak from what you were saying you just said that m2 is not so liquid so why is that M1 is part of M2. Okay, so this is basically a categorization by the central bank. Okay, so definitely you need the money. Even if you are saving in the bank, in the bank or wherever, you will need the money before you make that move. You take that money to the bank. Okay, so they are just looking at the process from you having the money so the time you deposit it, that's why we are having M1 in hold, the broad money. Oh, okay. You get it? Yes. Um, so yeah. My question is, if M1 and M2 are two different things and they can find M1 in M2, how can you distinguish them for the purposes of this course? Okay, so for the purpose of this course, the examiner will tell you which one consists of M1. Okay, so they will give you a list of, I'm coming, I want to check the tutorial set, uh, the, the very dark question and see if I can share it with you. I think tutorial set three or four, one of them, I'm coming. So that you have, you appreciate how we, we set that question, okay? All right. So they won't conflict. Yeah, they won't conflict. Please on my screen, what can you see? Say the broad money slide. Okay. I want to open it and share it. So give me some. I'm just now searching through. Thank you. 
Okay, so let me share that screen. This can you see this? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. All right, so the first question is for you to define the term, okay? Then we would ask you something about the money supply multiplier. We've not done this, okay? Don't worry. Now, look at the problem two. All else being equal, how would each of the following affect demand for M1, demand for M2? Explain. Okay. So we try, okay, basically we tried explaining the meaning of M1 and M2, okay, and we gave the categories. Okay. So now we asking you, how would this statement affect M1 and M2? Home equity lines of credit that allows homemakers to write check against the value of their home are introduced. Of course, you see this answer. That's why I told you with this course, you are not supposed to joke with it because these things can, I just want to get a simple example. Okay, so suppose Tabita or Tabata takes 500 from her savings account and deposits it in her checking account. What happens? Okay, so we are saying that, remember the savings account is what? M2, right? Yes, Good, M2. And she is now depositing it in what? Um, what? The checking account, which is so demand deposit account, which is what? M1. So what will happen to M1? We are saying M1 is going to increase, but M2 remains what? Unchanged. So why, why will M2, M2 remain unchanged if she's taking the 500 from her savings account? Good. So we are saying it to remain unchanged because remember m2 is made up of what m1 okay so if i'm taking it from m1 m2 and i'm giving it back to m1 remember two in the same suit so m2 will remain what unchanged please do you get it yes yes Good. then you moved some money from checking account into your savings account what happens now we are moving from m1 to what m2 from what your checking account which is demand deposit account to what savings account remember savings is what m2 so if i'm taking money from m1 and i'm putting it in what m2 what happens Every reason, and the reason is, please, are you here? It says, yes. yes, please. M1 is because they are taking it from your account, which is under M1. And you said M2 remain on chain okay. because M1 is in M2. So from like the same soup to the same soup. <laughs> I don't want good. I, I don't I don't want Kali that M2 will change because they are all in what the same soup. Nyantechi, please get it now. Nyantechi. Please, guys, do, can you hear me? Like if I talk, can you hear yes. me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Nyantechi is sleeping on his bed and he's chatting me, right? I guess. So he's not in the meeting. I think his network is disturbing him.
Hello, I'm sorry again. My network is logging, logging me out. You are welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, so after I was logged out, they are telling me the host disabled participant screen sharing. So I can't really share my screen. So if you know the host, tell the host to give me. All right, so now I'm the host. All right, I can now share. Okay, so as I told you earlier, in Ghana, we have uh, another category we call M2+. Plus, where in Ghana, when we say broad money, this is what we mean, the M2+. Plus. So the M2+, Plus also consists of M2 plus foreign currencies. Okay, so the M2 plus is also having the effect or the, it have all these components, M1 savings, time deposit, plus a foreign currency. You remember we, do, we, we use a lot of foreign currency, so you should get it if we are saying plus a foreign currency. Okay, we use the dollar a lot. Okay, so when I ask you, what are the combination? And remember in exams, most of you will do this mistake. My boss can ask you, what are the components of M2? Let me ask this question. What, is, what are the components of M2? Can someone tell me? So please, I, I'll try. Try for me. M1, savings account, time deposit, and time deposit account. Wrong. Can I try? Try for me. Paper currency and coins with the public, demand deposit accounts, savings accounts, time deposit accounts. Thank you very much. That's correct. So the exams, don't be so fascinated with the M1 because it's easy to see. First, tell us what is in M1. Define M1 before you tell us what is in M2. Okay, so in exams, usually we deal with the M2, which is what Ghana we are using. Okay, so we, we all the time put this in mind. First, define what is in, whether M1 or M2, especially when, let's say, you are dealing with M2+. plus. So who can tell me, um, if I tell you to tell me the component of M2+, plus, what do you think that will be? Please, please say something. Yes, I'll you know, try. Yes, I can do it to tell you maybe it's correct or wrong. Yeah. Okay, so try for me. Paper currency and so, credit okay. republic. Demand deposit, okay. savings okay. accounts, time deposit accounts, and foreign okay. currency. Thank you very much. So please, the one who said M1 plus savings accounts plus time deposit, you will give me that vim, that happiness to do wrong and give you zero. That's very, very nice. You know, if you don't write anything, marking becomes very simple. If you, if you write plenty, it's, it's hard. Yes, please. Sir, sir, um, yes, please. With, the, with, the, with the foreign currencies, is it, is it those that have been saved or foreign currencies in general, whether it's saved or people are having it or the public is having it? Okay, so basically when we say foreign currencies, okay. We are talking about the currency in circulation. We can, of course, we would also, we would have our own way of getting what is in the bank. Okay, so remember if it is in the bank and it is not in their vault, we should know that it means if it is in the bank, it has already been in the market. Okay, it's with the public before someone will take it to the bank. Okay, but if okay. let's say we have a printed 
foreign currency, but it is in the vault of what? Um, the Bank of Ghana, we can't classify that as what? Money with the public. Do you get it? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, sir, sir, sir. yes, yes. Sir, please, so in case objectives, they ask you that what is the component? You don't of... do objective in this course. Okay. Okay. If they ask you, in exams, what is the component of um, broad money in Ghana? Do you go with the M2 or you go with the M2 plus? Thank you very much. That's a nice question. Go with the M2 plus. Okay, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, guys, let me hit on this. In this course, we don't do objectives. So I really like it, what, how you guys, because we will give you the statement and tell you to write what you think is true about the statement. So in this course, we don't really, really, really prepare marking scheme. Okay. So if you see us preparing marking scheme, what all that we do is we are preparing the calculation bit or some basic, basic, basic stuff. Okay. Mostly it is true or false. So you can say true. And you will be wrong with the, um, let me say, your explanation. Or you can say false, and you will be right with the explanation. So we don't really have correct answer. It can be true, it can be false, or you can be uncertain. But where you argue your statement from is what will give you the max. Okay, so that's why I want you guys to understand every single statement in this course out, um, course. Um, Okay, so um, when we are doing telling us you refer to table 4.1 on the 17th of on 17 of the Bank of Ghana's quarterly bulletin for the second quarter of 2015. So we have to refer to this for something. And when you can only, we can do this when we are having our tutorial session. And I pray I get time to do this with you guys. Okay, it's really fun to be with you guys. All right, so now. So when, if we had downloaded that thing, okay, we will notice that it contains all the majority or the major monetary aggregates for Ghana for this period. So I told you we are going to use the current one probably 2020. If we go there and we see 2021, we will download that one rather. Okay, so it is going to tell us the monetary aggregates for Ghana. Okay, so you will see that when you download, you will see broad money narrow money m2 plus all all of them in what the bulletin so until we do that let's move to something more interesting called monetary aggregates so we are done right with monetary aggregates we are moving to something called demand for money okay so let me ask this question. Why would you want to hold money? Okay, why would you want to hold money? Or why do we hold money? Yes, sir. So for unforeseen circumstances or emergencies. So we would term that whole statement you just made as what well, precautionary hold measure. Okay, yes, so yes. we hold money for, all right. Johnson. Yeah, for investing. For investment. investment. Okay, so uh, I don't know where I will place that, but if I say investment, then we will talk about asset demand for the money. Okay, asset demand for the money. Um. Any other? Sir, for our basic needs. Okay, so so basically, I would term that as transactionary measure. So Esther is saying for emergency, so precautionary. Okay, then any other? Johnson, your hand is raised again. 
Yeah, All right. So there is one key one you guys are really not saying. Okay. And that key one is called um speculation measure. Okay. So we use we, we just want to hold money to take advantage of opportunities. Okay, so now let's say you'll be there, then they will tell you guys that oh, there is an opportunity for some of you to go outside of money. You, you, are, you are good to go. Okay, it's an opportunity. But if you don't have money, you lose that opportunity. Okay, so for precautionary hot, a speculative measure. All right. So that is it. Now, when we say demand for money, what is the whole idea about demand for money? When we say demand for money, this basically means that um, our desire to grant it. Okay, so you would want to hold money for the fun of it. It depends on the individual. Okay, don't hold me on on this. Some people would always want to have money in their pocket. Without money, they are not functioning. Okay, they are not in the world. Okay, so people would want to hold money for the most liquid um, desire. Okay, rather than maybe investing that money in what an interest bearing asset. Now, where do we get this? Or what are the two main sources of um, demand for money? And the sources are one, the first one, transaction demand for money. I will explain this in the details, okay? Transaction demand for money. And the other one is asset demand for money. And I also spoke of um, speculation and precaution. Okay, we can ask you to tell us why you hold money. And you know, you can't, you can't see the speculation here, but in your exams, you will see it because we said it in class. Now, when we say transaction money or transaction demand for money, all that we are trying to say is that, you know, you would want to hold money for you to make purchases of goods and services. You know, I always tell some people, uh, if you don't have money and you like going out plenty, one day someone will silence you and you wouldn't want to go out again because there are, um, how should I put it? Sometimes there are coincidences that are unwanted. Okay, when we say coincidence that are unwanted, you'll be walking and maybe someone's um, item are supposed to, you know, be destroyed and you will just be the one just there. So now you have to pay. You can also pour someone's stuff on the floor where you would need money to pay, okay? And if you don't have money on you at that time, you would be very hot. Okay. And that is why we are saying for precautionary measure, let's say you take care of home, you need money to cater for her, okay? Now, so with this transactionary measure, the main purpose is to buy goods and services, okay? Maybe you need food, you need money to buy, you need clothing, you need money to buy, you need something, you need money to buy, okay? So all these things are transaction or transactionary demand for what? Money. Now, let's try and make some small quantitative bit of this thing, okay? So a typical example is, suppose you earn 100 cities per month, and use all this amount for purchase of goods and services. We are saying that your average money balance for the month will be 50. Now, how do we get this 50? Let's do some small, it's not really a calculation, but I just want you to know where a 50 is coming from. So we are so, saying that- Sorry, but did you say transaction, um, transaction demand for money, um, it's also for the purpose of precautionary measures. No, I just brought in precautionary measures just to um, buttress something. Oh. Okay, I wanted to buttress something. But it's not, of course, you would want to hold money for these reasons. Okay, so if it is on you and you are not using it to buy anything, you would, and someone falls sick, even if it's your friend, you would want to save the person, right? You can't let the money rest, then your friend will die. Then all the carbon sour, right? So at the end of the day, you have to just give it out. 
Do you get it? Yeah. Yes. Good. So let's assume you have, you, you earn 100 cities per month, okay? So we are looking for the average. Hey, how is this thing writing like this today? But basically what I'm trying to say is you earn 100 cities per month, okay? And we are saying that at the end of the month or the, at the end of the year, you've spent all these 100 cities on purchase of goods and services. So how do we find average? Average is the 100 plus what you've spent all about to say, I do this, I'm going to get 50. And that's the 50 year. Please do get it. Okay, where do you get that tool from? No, please. Oh, finding average. When I ask you to find the average okay. of something, okay. all that I want to know is like the middle. It's in the middle, like okay. So yeah. is the fifth, the hundred plus what you spent? And remember, they said you spent all of them. Okay, so it's going to be the hundred plus the all of them, which is zero, all over two. And this should give me the 50. Yes. So you get it. Why is that all of them zero? I don't think I, I got you. Can you come back? Then please um why is it that um zero is part? They said you spent all of them. Okay, let's assume that the person has spent um 70. Uh, 70 all right, so meaning it's going to be 70 plus what? 30 at the end divided by two, which is also going to give you what? 50. So say it is what the what you spent plus the balance all over two. Do you get it? Say please is so is a formula what you what the amount you are having plus what you spent all over two or what you spent plus Thank the balance all over two. Okay, so let, let, let's make life very simple for you, okay? This is really not even a formula way, okay? So let's try something. N is equals to two, four. Find the average of this formula. How do we do this? So the average is like if I get the average of what I've written up here. You you add all over the number. So you add or divide by the number. Good. So and divide by five. Good. It is going to be two plus four plus six plus eight plus ten. All divided by what? Five. So this is how we find what average. Did you get it? But the case here, we just have it by hold two. Are we cool? All right, so we can proceed, right? So that's how we had the 50 year. So if someone asks you, where did you get a 50? Don't tell the person you don't know. That's how we had the 50. All right, so yes, please. I don't know if you are aware someone is disturbing us. My network. Um, your network. I didn't see how you calculated for the. Okay, so Michelle, what we are trying to say is, we were told that, okay, we were told that, suppose you end 100 cities per day, per month, okay, 100 cities per month, and per month, this is and and you use 
all this amount for purchase of goods and services. So we want to, I just wanted you guys to understand how we had this 50. So I told you that, you, say, you see we, we wrote, your average money balance for the month will be 50. So how do we get the average? And the average is what I'm saying that is the 100 plus all that you spent, okay? Or the amount you spent out of it, which is basically zero, all over two. We just have two numbers here, one, one, two. If it was three, it would be all over three, four, all over four. So looking at this, we just have 100 divided by which is uh, 50. Michelle, do you get it? Michelle. Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah. yeah, so please, what if you spend, what if you spend just 70 Ghana cities? I say it is going to be 30 plus. 70 divided by 2. 70 divided by 2. Okay. All right. That's fun. All right. So let's proceed. So we have this to be. Yes, please. Sir, please. So if I get what you are saying, it's supposed to be what you spend plus the remaining divided by 2. All right, yes, please. But no one would ask you to do that, actually. I just wanted you guys to understand. All right, so please can you proceed? Yes, yes, please. Okay, so um, you remember in our course objective, we said that we will learn demand for money, then the determinant, okay? So transaction demand for money, okay, is affected by a number of factors. And a typical example is what we call interest rate, okay. So all that we are trying to put across here is interest rate is the opportunity cost of putting money. Okay, when we say opportunity cost, we are just saying that it's the best for going or ten. Okay, so if you sacrifice one item to the other, so look at what we have here. If we, we said that the, so if let's say the interest rate and savings is very high, you would want to hold less money. Okay, so you would want to do more of investment. So this time you are going to what? hold on to your consumption and invest more. Okay, so this affects what your demand for your transaction demand for money. And you know, if interest rate is very low, no one would want to save. So people would want to hold more money. Okay, that's why we are saying the interest rate has an effect on what the transaction demand for money. Okay, other determinants of transaction demand for money are the level of what price and income. And you know, when we did microeconomics, we said that prices and income have effect on what? Our demand. So if prices increases, we would want to buy less of that commodity. Okay. And if prices decreases, you would want to buy more of it. So if income, you have more income, you buy more. And if you also have less income, you buy less. Okay, so all these things are just the factors that are towards transaction demand for money. Okay, so if price double, holding other things constant, you need twice as much to buy the same quantity of goods and services. So that's basically what I said. If prices increase, you would want to buy less. And if prices decreases, you would want to what, buy more of that particular commodity. Are we on the same platform? Yes, yes, sir. Now, now, let's talk about asset demand for money. So when we say asset demand for money, the whole idea is very simple. Okay, so this time round, 
you wouldn't want to. Remember, we said money sells as a store of value. Now, if you sell, sell your products, okay, and you get money, you would want to store it, okay, by investing in what? Um, interest bearing assets, okay. So that's the whole idea about asset demand for money. So people would want to um, hold money, they want to invest in high interest bearing assets so that they could hold get some interest on it or better so if you have so much money on you that fear that people can come and rob you is very high. So you would want to save it in the bank so that you feel safe in your home. Okay, so that is so please can so, you go over the line was speaking, so I didn't hear. I don't think you're the only one. I was logged out again. Okay. So now I have the permission to enter. So I'm here. Okay. So I don't know what is causing that. Okay. So I asked the question what is a financial system? Okay. And. I, they managed to just eject me from the system. Okay, so, so basically, can you, can you talk about the asset demand for money? Your line was breaking at that time. Oh, so can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, that's great. Kafra. So, all that we spoke of asset demand for money is very simple. You remember one of the functions of um, demand for money was asset demand for money. Functions of demand for money, we said is a store of value, okay? And you are saying that if you sell your products, you get money, then you store. So what we are trying to say with the asset demand for money is that if you sell those produce, then you get the money. Individuals would want to save these monies in a high interest bearing asset. Okay. You know, you wouldn't want to hold sums of money. Take yourself as a cocoa farmer. Even sleep at night because you are you're having that fear that people can come and just take the money away from you. Okay, so such a person would want to invest that amount of money in a high interest bearing asset so that he can feel safe. Okay, because you know if your money is in the bank, that one if they they should go and rob the bank, that that is not your issue. Your issue is 
you have the money in your possession and you just want it to leave your possession. Okay, and that is the whole idea about asset demand for, for money. Please, you get it. Yes, please. Please, please, please can you give the, an example of the high interest bearing asset? Okay, so um, sick of COVID, okay, I wouldn't want to commit myself because most of the interest rates are now down, okay, because of COVID. But you investing in fixed deposit is not bad, okay. And others are also investing in um, real estate, you know. There are so many investment activities you can undertake and get money. And now the financial system is not really, really strong because of COVID, okay? A lot of downturns in it. So I wouldn't want to um, suggest anything now. Are you cool? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. So now I started with a financial system. So when we talk about financial system, all that we are saying is very simple. The financial system captures activities involving finance in an economy. Okay. So it's responsible for linking the other markets within the economy. Okay. So the financial system makes it possible to link the individuals to the bank, individuals to maybe the insurance company, mutual fund, stay in the comfort of your home, just invest in something, okay? They are saying my internet is not stable. I don't know if that is what is causing the sound. Yeah, yeah so it's been breaking since okay. you spoke about financial systems. Then the world is against me, me and the world today. Please, can you hear me? Banana, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so all that I was saying is that the financial system um, captures the activities involving financing and economy. Okay, so it's basically responsible for linking the other markets within the economy. So we have the goose market and the factor markets. Okay, if you could remember, when we were doing the circular cash flow diagram, we said something about the factor market and the goods market. Okay, so that is the duty of the financial system, just to bring the two of us together. Okay, so the financial market links the economic agents within the economy. And the economic agents are the households, the firms, and the government carrying on their financial decisions. Okay, so it gives us the opportunity to be able to transact with each other. Okay, so if there is no bank, how would you save? If there is no stock exchange market, how would you save or invest? Okay, all these things are the job of what a financial market. Okay, now the most important financial, okay, so we have um, the financial market is actually made up of financial intermediaries and the financial market. So the system is made up of these two. When we say financial intermediary, they are basically the companies that link us to those two economic agents. Now, putting that aside, the financial intermediaries, what they do is they borrow or they mobilize savings from the surplus units and lend it towards those who need funds. Example, like the banks. Okay, so banks will take your money as savings and give it to those who need money. Okay, so that is one work of the bank. They serve as what, an intermediary between these two economic agents. So the households will come and save their money. So those who have surplus will come and save their money. Then those who have deficit will come and borrow from the bank at an agreed interest rate. Then, so that is basically how the process works. So bank will take money from you and give it to those who don't have money. And those ones are what we call the financial intermediaries. Okay. Now, when we say financial market, it's a market where um, financial securities are bought and sold. Okay. So when I say financial securities, they're also known as the financial instruments. Example, like stocks, bonds, currencies, where they are bought and sold 
are what we call the financial market. But financial intermediaries, as I told you earlier, they serve as a link, okay? So they mobilize savings from surplus units and lend them towards those who need funds. And I gave you an example of that. An example of financial intermediary is the bank. We can talk of mutual funds. We can also talk of insurance companies. That's what they do, okay? They are financial intermediaries. Now, when I talk about financial institutions, okay, basically the three year are the government ones. Okay, so we have commercial bank, we have NIB, which is National Investment Bank, then we have the central bank. Okay, they are also known as, they are the financial institutions who link or who borrow from us and give to those who need money. Okay, so others include the mutual fund, the mortgage buyers, then derivative firms, okay. So what are some of the rules of the financial system? The first rule of the financial system is mobilizing and allocating resources. Already I've explained this, that they mobilize and they take money from those with surplus fund and give it to those with de uh, deficit. Okay, so they collect savings from those who don't need it and give it to those who need it. So that's the mobilizing and allocating resources. That's one function, okay? And the second one is they manage risks in the economy or within the economy. Okay, so let's, a, a typical example is, um, assuming you are going in for a loan at a bank, okay? We are expecting that the bank loan officer needs to assess your application and decide whether to give you the loan or not, okay? So as a result of the bank loan officer doing this, we say that they are trying to reduce risks in the market or in the economy, okay? So if you come and we give the money to you, you can, because maybe what you are going to use the money for, it's not going to yield any profit. So after the bank loan officer assessing you, he can decide, to say, let's give the money to him, or we shouldn't give the money to him. The next one is acting as a clearing house. Okay, so when you say the financial system acts as a clearing house, receive check from someone. Okay, someone dashes you check. Please my giving me a notice can you hear me that's my internet is not stable can you hear me please, yes can you hear it's me? okay but it's breaking some phone but it's manageable okay so oh please manage for me hmm. i don't know why the network is doing this to me okay so when we say um the financial system acts as a clearing house all that we are saying is, let's say someone issue a check to you, okay? Then you would have to go and deposit it into your bank account or better still go and withdraw it, okay? There has to be a reconciliation between your bank and their bank to know whether there is sufficient amount in that particular account, that particular person's account before it is paid to you. Okay, so you take money from some, or someone gives you a check as a gift, and maybe you want to go and cash out. When you get there, your bank needs to check, okay? Or there should be a reconciliation. Your bank and their bank to know that whether that individual have enough funds in his account before we can what, pay you, clearing houses, okay? And the last one is across space and time. You know, typical example is now you can see 
home and send momo into your bank account okay and this is where i would advise you never to link your bank accounts with any more your any of your money. okay and i'm saying on bobra for a reason you'll be there you This is okay now. Sir, this is okay, but I think you yes. have to take that point again. Which point? Can you help Trans me with that? Transferring resources you were across about space and time. Yeah. So, you know, transferring, um, you can be able to stay in the comfort of your home and transfer money from your to your bank accounts or withdraw money from your money. You guys that never, even if the bank tells you, you know, if you really, really want to save and you do that, you can't save because you'll be there. Someone will call you. Oh, please, can you? Me fifty cities. Maybe you have a good heart, so you'll be tender. Then you'll go into your mama, your bank account. You'll be there. Oh, let me buy two city credits. Go on. Okay, so I wouldn't really that. Are we cool? <laughs> yes. Sir. All right, yes. so this is the last part of the line is bad. It's very bad. It is called fractional reserve banking. We are seeing the harsh. Is it okay now? Yes. Yes, it's okay. Please forgive me for today. Maybe I have to reallocate myself the next time. Okay, so if it is okay, then please alert me when, if you can hear. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. No, if you can hear, and I'm moving on. So we are going to, and the whole idea of this is very simple. We are saying that the commercial bank don't pretend how the commercial bank is able to create money without printing. Okay, so this is very simple. So now, so this is the point I just read to you, this point. Please, it's breaking. Please, Commercial banks do not print money and they contribute to money supply. Through the deposit creation, so we are going. To... Please, is it okay now? Please, is it yes. okay now? Yes, yes. yes. Can you hear me now? yes. Sir. yes. yes. Okay. Okay. I try. You didn't make call, and you assigned me about why. Call. 
Please forgive me for today, okay? It's not me. Yes, Please, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, so I was talking of fractional reserve banking. Okay, and I was telling you that commercial banks don't really print money, but they create money through what? Deposit creation. Okay, so we are going to learn how commercial bank does this. Okay, so we are whatever we are going to say here, okay, it's an assumption. Don't don't take it from any other side. Put all other things constant, okay? So they receive deposits from customers and are able to create more money by making loans to other clients, okay? So now we are going to talk about the balance sheet of the commercial bank, okay? So that's in their vaults, loans, securities and reserves. Okay, I don't know if you can hear because they just sent me a message that my internet is unstable. So I can hear you. No, we can I hear. Okay. Thank God. So that's the asset side. Remember when we were doing bank reconciliation statements with them? So if I'm saying that, don't be some. Okay, so when we're doing the bank reconciliation, this is the only accounting um, statement. Object that actually okay, so that is only accounting that breaks the rule of double entry principle. Okay, for one reason, if you if you deposit your money into the bank, you know, breaking said that the, so the, what you said. the giver. Okay, so you were the one giving the money. So the bank was supposed to, or the one receiving, they are supposed to debit their account. But they credit, oh dear. All right, can you hear me now? Please, can you hear me now? Yes, please. Sir, so can you say what you were saying about the bank reconciliation statement? Okay, so what I was trying to say about the bank reconciliation statement is that it is the only accounting, um, that breaks the rule of um, double entry principles. Okay. And I said that with the double entry principles, we said that debit the receiver and credit the giver. Okay. But this time around, if you deposit your amount with the bank, the bank, instead of, you know, you are the one giving the money to them, so they should have credited your account, but rather the bank would debit their account will debit your cash book, okay? Remember, if you know our parents who really save in the bank, the bank will take that book, that small book, and rather debit it and credit their account, okay? Because the bank sees the money you are giving to them as a loan, and because it's a loan, they will rather debit your account and credit their account instead of what? Crediting your account and debiting the account. Okay, so with the double entry principles. Okay, so if you see the asset side of the bank, you could see that we have cash in their vault, then we have loans. Loans here are those amounts of money we fought deposited with the bank. So you see, the bank is treating it as what? asset okay so you will deposit your amount with them 
and they will also give this out to some people. Now let's look at the, the sorry, the liability side. You could see that the liability side includes the amount you've deposited with them. Instead of them seeing this as an asset, they rather see it as what a liability because they have to really pay you back. You see that we have the savings account because you are saving with them. They assume they have to pay you back and the time deposit account. So you could see all these three are amounts you rather give to them instead of them to debit their accounts because they are the ones receiving and credit your accounts. Rather, they do the opposite. That's why we say the bank reconciliation statement does not follow what the double entry principle. And you know, in accounting, all points, your debit side should equal your credit side. So this is the balance sheet of the commercial bank. And this is what I was trying to explain. Okay, so these are the deposits commercial bank are able to make. You know, with a commercial bank, they are required, okay, all banks are required to keep a, a certain percentage as a certain percentage as required reserve, which will be sent to the central bank. Okay. So in this case, looking at this, they are keeping 20% of this as reserve. Okay, so out of this thousand they made, they are keeping 20% of it. And they would be able to make it. And you know, at all points, we should have a balance thousand and here is also thousand. Please do we get it? Yes, sir. Yes. We get it. Yes, sir. All right. Okay, so now how do commercial banks create money? And this is the point where yes, I don't want Victor. you to think outside anything. Just take it just as we are staying here. So we are assuming an economy where is it okay now? So we couldn't hear anything, no. So but now we can. This is okay now. Yes. Yes. Hello. Yes. Is this still um, breaking? It's okay now. Yes, it's, it's okay. okay. Lisa, are you here with me? We are left to just uh, three slides, yeah. then we are done. Are you here? Oh. Yes. So can you hear me now? Yes. 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 So you couldn't hear anything when I was asking. So just from the deposit situation. That's <laughs> not. Lady, forgive me, okay. Please, you okay now? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. So, whoever has been making me the okay. So, thank you. All right. So, did you get an explanation for this? Yes. No, we couldn't the presentation. Oh, okay. Okay. So. Let's go to deposit creation. So there's the point where I want you to take them from that place. This place. This one. Yes, please. All right. So all that I'm, I was trying to say is very simple here. So when you give your money to the bank, okay, the bank will record it as a liability because they feel like they're owing you. So they have to pay you back. So that's the deposit here, okay? And the bank is required to keep a certain percentage with the Bank of Ghana or the central bank. 
So looking at the calculation here, it means the bank is supposed to keep 20% of this with the central bank. So that's the reserves. Okay, and we are keeping this for unforeseen um, circumstances, like when they were sweeping the banking system. Okay, so... Okay, so I don't think it's me. So if the bank, those banks that were keeping this percentage with the commercial, the central bank, when there is a case like a closure, okay, or when they are declared illiquid, okay, they will be able to resort to this amount, which is with the, the central bank in order to pay its customers. So all banks are required to keep a certain percentage with the central bank, which is in this case 20%. Then out of this, because we are keeping 20% with the central bank, all that we can do is give outwards only 80%. So, yeah. Who is that? Michelle. Okay, so all that we are saying is, out of this, the bank can only give out 80% as loans and investments. Okay, so if you multiply 80 times, the 80% times this will give you the 800 here. Okay, so that is all about it. So the asset side is what they are keeping as reserved and the loans they are also giving out. But the liability side is the amount you gave them that you would eventually come for it later. So this is how the banking system works. They take your money, they keep a reserve, they give out this. Okay, so that's how the bank works, the banking system works. Now, when we say deposit creation, the deposit creation is basically commercial bank trying to create more money out of money if we received instead of for printing more money because they don't have the authority to print out money. It's only the Bank of Ghana that prints out money. Uh, someone would ask, why is it something we seem to care? Okay, the truth is we have the opportunity to create a print out our own money. Okay, but because of the case of inflation, if government decides to print out so much money, I told you, I think last the last two lectures, I told you that if they print out more money, it is going to cause inflation and the economy is going to be very hard. Okay, that is why sometimes they decide not to do all these things. Okay, so looking at this, looking at this, again, don't, don't think outside. Let's take this one by one. We are considering an economy where they don't produce goods and services. All that they do is they take loans and they deposit. All that, that is all that they are doing. Okay, so consider the case of a new bank whose first client makes 100 cities deposit. Okay, so we are considering a bank where its first client just gave them 100 cities to deposit. Okay, as I told you, with this case, the bank is required to what? keep 10% out of this 100. So if the bank is keeping 10% of this, it's just 10 cities, right? So now the bank would be able to give out what? 90 cities as what? So they could be able to give out 90 cities as what? Loans to other people. Okay, so we are assuming that deposited um, 100 cities with the bank. The bank kept... 10% and now gave out 90 cities to another person. And that person didn't also work with the money. The person also went straight to another bank and gave the, that bank the 90 cities as what? His deposit. Okay, so that's bank two. So when bank two receives this 90 cities, bank two is also expected to keep 10% of this 90 cities. Now bank two, 10% of this will give us this nine. Okay, so bank two will also now have only 81 cities to give out as loans. Okay, now 
and two, let's assume there is another person who also came for this 81 person, 81 cities as a loan. Now, this person also never worked with the money. And the person went straight to another bank and deposited that 81 cities with another bank. Okay, so after that deposit, you should know that the bank is also supposed to keep what um 10, 10 of this and give out what the 79 81 so 8.1 so let's say 10 percent of it and give 72.9 as loans okay so looking at the bank statement or the balance sheet of the first bank someone gave them 100 cities and they kept what 10 cities and gave out 90 as a loan so someone came for this money. The person also took this money to another bank. The bank also took 10% of it and gave out um, 81 as a loan to another, another person. That person also went to another bank, which is a third bank. And the person went to deposit 81 cities with that bank. So that bank is also supposed to keep what? Um, 10% of this 81, which is eight cities, 10 pesos. So that bank also have the right to give out only 72.9%, only 72.9 Ghana cities as a loan. Okay, so looking at, at, a, at this point, the total amount additional demand deposit created out of the initial 100 cities is sort. 2439. Okay, so out of the 100 cities someone deposited, the commercial bank for the three banks now has been able to create out what? 2439. Remember, someone gave us 100. And we also gave someone 90. The person also took the 90 to some people. They, they also kept a percentage. Now we have 81 as the 72. So when we add all of this, we are going to get this. Okay, so this is how the commercial bank actually creates what money. Okay, now that is out of the hundred cities. So we can allow this process to continue, and we can show that total additional amount of demand deposit that can be created out of this initial deposit is nine hundred. Okay, I'm going to explain this with something called the money multiplier. Okay, money supply multiplier. You would understand it. So if we continue with this the, um this process, so now this 72 would have been given to another bank, they will also keep 10%, they will keep the another person will come. Ah, so the last person gets zero amount we would have created thousand Ghana cities out of what the hundred. So this is how commercial bank actually creates out money. Please do we get it up to this point? Yes. yes. Okay. So don't just take it. Don't don't think about someone now taking the money and using it to go and farm or something. So it's all about someone taking, giving it to another bank, another bank giving it to another person, another person giving it to another bank. Ah, so the last person getting zero. Okay. And we are saying that by the end of the last person, we have to get thousand Ghana cities. Okay, so now let's see what we meant by this. So we are going to understand this by what? Using the money multiplier. If this tells, we are saying we are supposed to make 1,000 out of the 100, the money multiplier will tell us. What is the money multiplier? The money multiplier is the ratio change in the new money created to the change in the reserve. So this is the formula. Change in money over reserve, which is the same as one over the required reserve ratio. So the RRR is required reserve ratio. Now let's see if this is true. Let's learn some small math here. Okay, so the amount that we had was what? Okay, the amount that we received from someone was 100, right? And we are saying that out of this, so this is the quantity of money we had. Out of this, we would be able to produce what? More than what? Thousands, 
um, approximately 1,000 Ghana cities at the end of the last person. So we are going to use this money multiplier to know the, no the amount we are supposed to make out of this 1,000. So if I ask you to calculate the total amount we would have made, then it is going to be the one over the RRR times the 100, the quantity we have. Remember the RRR was 10%, right? So it's going to be one over 10% times 100. If you like punch this, you should get 1,000. Please do we get it? Yes, sir, a thousand. Yes, so that's basically what we are trying to put across. Okay, that's basically what we are trying to put across. So, you know, we will get to a point where this required reserve ratio will come back again when we are doing monetary policy. Okay, where we would say that if government wants to take money from the system, there is something called required reserve. So, if government decides to increase this required reserve this amount of money would be let's say if government increased this to 20 percent okay if government increased this to 20 percent you see that this would decrease if he you go know, as he's increasing it means he's taking money from the system now we could have increased up to what thousand if he increased to 20 percent this will reduce meaning there will be small amount of money in the system or money supply in the system. It's all about this um, so, money creation or fractional reserve banking. Please, you don't get it up to this point. So please, can you take the money supply? You know, the internet yeah, is it mine or yours? Please, is it mine or yours? Because yours is also terrible. Mine. So I just need multiply. Right. Okay, so the money supplier, the formula is one over RRR. Okay, and in our situation, the RRR was what? 10%. Okay, so I was saying that. Let's assume the examiner asks you, at the end of the last person, how much money we would be able to make at the end of the last person? Then it is going to be what? The RRR, which is one over RRR, times the amount we received. Okay, so this is going to be the total amount we will get. Okay, total amount we will get. So, if I do this, it's one over the 10% times the 100. If you multiply this, you are going to get a 1,000. Okay, so we are saying that at the end of the last person, out of the 100 cities we initially um, received, we will be able to create additional 900 in the economy. Please, you get it. Yes. So that is how we say commercial banks don't print out money, but rather they create money through deposit creation. So that is all. So please, why is it that in their formula it is equal to one over RRR, but you multiply it by hundred? So the one over RRR, which is this side, is what we call the money multiplier, and this is the quantity you received. So we don't use the change in money over change in reserves. Oh, that's what you see. That's the simplification of this. Because remember, if I have change, I can just take this change change out. Do you get it? Please do you get it. Yes. Yeah. So uh, yes. Okay. So say that I mean the one is the money. <laughs> So basically, that's the idea. Or oh, the one is a, is a constant. Uh, okay. So, see, if I have this like this, you know, one times this to give me the money in the market, right? Yes. So someone yes. can easily say that, okay, let's, let's, let's make life simple. Okay, so... 
Someone can, if we should ask you what is the total money created in the market, okay, see something. Someone can say the total money created is what, 100 over the 10 percent, which is still the same as a thousand. You see, mm. you still get the same formula. You get it. So, yes. the, the, the reason. The, the, the formula is one over the um, reserve um, requirement ratio. Okay. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. So, you know, you get to understand this when you are doing tutorials. So the first question we would always ask you guys is calculate the money multiplier. If I ask you to calculate the money multiplier, that's one over what? The 10%. Okay. okay. That is the only thing. But if I ask you what to be the total deposit creation, then what that we are trying to tell is to multiply the money, money multiplier by the amount initially deposited. Do you get it? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. So to conclude this, okay, with this approach, we need to make some assumption. And the assumption is what I told you. Don't think outside the box, okay? So all that you need to be thinking is, we are assuming that all money is kept within the banking system. So um, let's say you, you, you don't take the money to go and do anything. You take the money for only deposit. You get it. So that, that's the first assumption, which is this. Okay. So the assumption is, one, it is assumed that all money is kept, all money is kept within the banking system. Of course, we know in practice that can never happen. That someone will go and borrow and go and give it to the bank and borrow and we don't, it doesn't work that way. Definitely someone will come and borrow and go and do business with it. But we want to place this under certain restriction, how the commercial bank would be able to make money. Okay, so banks cannot make loan out of what? Such money. Okay, so we keep the reserve, so it is not always the case that the bank only keep the reserve, required reserve. In practice, some bank keeps excess reserve. Okay, so let's say the Bank of Ghana will tell you keep 20%, but some banks can decide to keep 30%. In order to also run their own operations, they will keep 30%. And that 10% will be for them to also make their small, small rounds. Okay, so since the last financial crisis, some commercial central banks have started paying interest on what the reserves. Okay, so remember, if the banks keep that reserve and they give it to the central bank, the central bank also undertakes some investment activities which it receives um, interest on them. So as a result, they also get some interest, even though they are not supposed to pay any interest on them. Because of financial crisis, some of them decide to what, pay interest on them. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope we all understood what we did. Yes. yes sir. If you have any questions. Yes, sir. If you have any question, I think you can now ask me. Okay, so in the absence of any question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, um. Take the very last point. How um, central uh, banks have started paying interest on reserves. Okay, so all that we are trying to say is, you know, let's assume the financial crisis came as a result of COVID. Okay, so most banks are not having enough funds to give out as loans. Okay, 
and the central bank or the Bank of Ghana decides to pay interest on the amount they already have with them. Okay, so you remember we also established that the commercial banks, when they do this deposit creation, they keep a reserve with the central bank. So let's assume the commercial bank have um, some amount of money with the central bank. Okay, so the central bank, because of this COVID, they can decide to pay interest on it so that the commercial bank could have enough money to give out as loans to the citizens in order to reduce the pressure in the economy. So that's basically what we were talking about. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, in the absence of any question, I would say thank you for coming. We we'll would end here and meet next week, Tuesday. All right, so thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>